All right, with further ado, if you have your Bibles with you, and especially if you're here this morning, you're somewhat new to the Bible, the passage that I'm going to have you turn to should be pretty easy to find in the Bible. So if you go to the very front of the Bible and you go to the second book of the Bible, that's where we're at, the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus and we're going to be considering um, part of chapter 4 today. The, the book of Exodus is basically about the exodus or the departure of the people of God from the land of Egypt where they had been enslaved for 430 years. So imagine that. And God chose a man to lead our ancestors, the people of Israel, out of Egypt and his name was Moses. Now, the reason why we're looking at this passage very simply this morning is because we just had the installation of office bearers, of two elders and a deacon, and I want to focus on not only leadership here this morning, but the natural feelings of apprehension and inadequacy that I think most men who take their offices seriously do feel to a certain degree certainly was the case with Moses. So I want to draw your attention now to Exodus chapter 4, and I want to begin reading at verse 1. God has called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. This is no small task, um, because uh, as commentators say, the, the, the people of Israel at this point may have been um, about a million strong. So, you know, what we have here, a couple hundred? Imagine being a solo person for over a million um, that's quite significant. So no wonder Moses is feeling apprehensive. Chapter 4, verse 1, Then Moses said to the Lord, But behold, this is after God called him to lead his people, Behold, they won't believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord didn't appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And Moses said, A staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. Kids, that means that that when Moses threw his staff, his big stick on the ground, it turned into a snake. Can you imagine that? And Moses ran from it, but the Lord said to Moses, put your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand, and he caught it, and it became like a staff once again in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take out some water from the Nile River and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. When we end our reading at that point, this morning, you know, we're going to look simply at what I call the Moses syndrome. The Moses syndrome. That is the the natural apprehension, reserve, and feelings of inadequacy 
that uh, when a man is considered for office and when a man says yes to the office. As I said, you know, when you, when you take your office seriously, when you, take, when you take the calling and the work that you have as a pastor, elder, or deacon, even remotely seriously, you're going to feel a certain amount of weight that comes with that. I remember um, about 30 years ago, uh, I had, it was about 30 years ago, um, I experienced my own ordination service. Now, for those of you who are here, and maybe the kids are wondering this too, how, how, does a, how, does a, how does a guy actually become a pastor? Well, it usually begins in this way, and I'll be brief with it. First, it begins with you running away from the call of the Lord, okay? You don't, you don't want to face that. And I remember uh, a pastor one time saying to me, you know, Phil, he said, uh, there's a little bit of Jonah in everybody, okay, so remember that. But eventually, if the Lord truly has his hand on you, you, you can't run away from that, and you consider that. So there's, what, first of all, what we call an internal call. But then when a man receives an internal call from the Lord to say, you know, um, I want you to be a pastor, elder, or deacon, the man just doesn't thrust himself in front of people and say, okay, well, God has called me. You know, sometimes you hear this among Christian leaders, God has called me, and therefore that gives him the right. No, it doesn't give him the right. In our circles, there needs to be an internal call followed by an external call. That means that usually there are, if that man is part of a local church, it's the elders and the deacons, and, and maybe a pastor comes alongside and say, you know what, we recognize the gifts that you have, and if they take this man seriously enough, they say, okay, now you need to be trained before you can go into the ministry, and so we'll support you in that. All right, so then a man goes to seminary, and a seminary is a place where men learn theology and a lot of other things in order to prepare themselves for the pastorate, and that's usually three or four years. For my, for my training, it was about four years, a place called Mid-America Reform Seminary, uh, of which now I'm on the board of that seminary, uh, seminary. That's what happens when you get older. And then, even after you go to seminary, that doesn't, therefore, guarantee that you're going into the pastorate. You first have to go through a series of examinations, written examinations and oral examinations, and usually a man's ordination exam usually lasts anywhere from, you know, five, six, seven hours. It's a whole day affair, okay, because they want to make sure that you are equipped for the ministry. Then after that, that does not even guarantee that you're going to go into the ministry. You are now declared a candidate for call, and after you get that call from a church, hopefully, then you have to decide, am I going to accept this call or am I not? And if you accept the call, then, then you have to go through an ordination service. So you see all the things that lead up to that. And I remember the ordination service very quickly. A form was read at one point in the service, and then I was called to come forward, and a number of elders and pastors who were present came forward. I think there was between 8 and 10 at the time. And then what happens is you actually go down on your knees because that is a, that is a posture of humility and service. And you go down on your knees, and then the pastor and the elders, they come around, and what they do is they place their hands on your shoulders and when they place those hands on your shoulders, it feels like the weight of an elephant is on your shoulders because you're just feeling, you're feeling the, the weight of your calling, right? And then I remember that, and I remember a pastor saying these words, and I looked up the words in a form again, and this is what he said. God, our Heavenly Father, who has called you to the sacred office, guide you by His Word, equip you with His Spirit, and so prosper your ministry that His church may increase and His name be praised. Amen. Then after that, you get up, and with the elders and pastors there, you sit down in your pew, you finish out the worship service, you have some time of fellowship, refreshments, you go home, right, and then you fall asleep that night, and the next day you wake up, and you feel this. You go like, who, who is, <laughs> like Moses, who is adequate for this? Who is adequate for this? And the Lord says, you're not adequate, honestly, but I am. And as the Bible says in so many words, where the Lord guides, He provides. As God says to Moses here in this passage, I am with you. I am with you. That's the encouragement of our passage, and that's the encouragement I want to bring to your attention here this morning. Let's deal with Moses. I want to go through this quickly. You have Moses who is called by God to lead his people out of Egypt after 430 years of slavery. It is a daunting task. Um, the people are fearful. 
because they don't know what the future holds for them. It's like a person who's been in prison for 20 years, and all of a sudden they re-enter into society. They don't know what to do. They don't know how they're... They've never really had a decent job before. They don't know how to work. They don't, they don't know how to supply their own... I mean, this, their own needs. This is what it was for the people of Israel. They were imprisoned in Egypt. So now they, they have fear. They have to go through a desert on the way to a land that God reserved for them, the promised land. And not only um, are they fearful, but they know that Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is a stubborn, stubborn man, and it may require a lot of pain on their part actually to even get out of Egypt. And then you have Moses, who has to shoulder all this responsibility. And it's there's honestly there are feelings of great inadequacy. And Moses actually says this to God. Now, if you have, it's not on the overhead, but if you have a Bible, take a look at chapter 3, verse 11. Moses said to God, chapter 3, verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, mm, But I will be with you. But I will be with you. The, the interesting thing about this is, is this is not the last time that God actually says this in the Bible. God says to Moses, who's feeling greatly inadequate, God says, I will be with you. God says to the prophet, uh, or, or before I get to the prophet Jeremiah, God says to Moses' successor, Joshua, remember Moses led the people out of Egypt, and then it's Joshua who becomes the successor to actually move the people into the promised land. And God said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God comes to Jeremiah the prophet. God calls him to be his mouthpiece to God's people. And you remember Jeremiah's answer? He says, I, I'm only a youth. It's like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. God says, I will be with you. And then one final thing. Before the disciples carry out the mission mandate that Christ gave them, Jesus spoke these words and he said, if I can recall them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then he ends with this phrase, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. He doesn't say, I'm with you, but he says, I'm basically with you always. You see that refrain? We're never alone. So this should give every pastor and every elder and every deacon, and by the way, a number of you here also have unordained leadership positions, whether it be with women's ministry or leading care groups or what have you. This should give us, as leaders, this should give us all the encouragement in the world knowing that we don't do this alone. But then you know how it goes, right? Okay, I know, I should trust the Lord in this, but, we give this qualifier, but, dot, dot, dot. A young guy entering office for the first time could go, I've never done this before. Uh, I've either received little training or no training at all. I guess I'm supposed to learn by osmosis. I don't know what I'm doing. A guy who's served at times before, like Fritz, Fritz and I are about the same age. We've been, been there, done that a little bit. But sometimes when a guy gets older, he wonders, am I going to be able to carry through to the end? I mean, I'm getting older. I don't have the energy that I used to have. And then there are other men who are just like, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to say something stupid. I don't know if I'm going to do something stupid. I don't know if... If, oh, I don't know if I'm going to crash or burn, you know. And this is, this, is, this is what goes on in a man's head. Why do I say that? Well, because it's true, number one. Um, but number two is because that's, that's a little bit of an indication of what we have here in this passage with Moses. Moses has three fears, and I'll go through them quickly. Three fears. He's got a fear of rejection. He's got a fear of failure. And he's got a fear of responsibility. First of all, there's a fear of rejection. Lord calls him, and Moses says, yeah, but the people aren't going to believe me or listen to my voice. And they're going to say, the Lord hasn't appeared to you. So all of a sudden, you have, you have this, not only this fear of inadequacy, but the, the fear that, you know, okay, now all of a sudden, he has to lead the people of God, and they're not going to respond positively to that. They're going to go, uh, no, no, why should we follow you? God, God didn't call you. Sometimes you, you get uh, pastors and elders and deacons who kind of feel the same thing. They kind of go, yeah, well, 
now here I am. I'm a pastor, elder, deacon. Am I supposed to assume that suddenly now everybody's just going to follow me? Um, how do I know that they're not thinking, come on, you know, you're, you're no different than we are. Listen, you know, Jesus faced that too in his ministry. Do you remember that? Um, there's one point in the Bible where Jesus is preaching and teaching, carrying out his ministry, and one man says in a crowd, he goes, huh, this, this, this Jesus, this Jesus, he, uh, yeah, isn't, isn't he the, the son of Joseph, the carpenter? Yeah, yeah. And, and isn't Mary his mother? And, and, and doesn't he have these brothers, James and Joseph and Judas? Not Judas Iscariot, another Judas, but... Yeah, we, we know his family. We know his dad. We know his mom. We know his brothers. What, you know, with, with, the, with the idea like, well, then he's just no different than we are, right? And yet what? He's the Messiah? All right. Um, yeah, he's no different than we are. And Moses must have felt that as well. Um, listen, as regards myself or our new elders or our new deacons or those who are serving presently, ask yourself the question, are they different than you are? Yes or no? And the answer is, actually, it's not either or, it's both. They're no different from you because we're all sinners. Um, we all put our foot in our mouth sometimes. We are all weak and we are all frail. So you know what? Uh, we're all together in this and yet and yet we are different and you know how we're different we're not different in terms of being better but we wear the badge if i may put it this way imagine growing up in a small town and you, everybody knows each other and you got a guy who goes through training and he comes a police officer he's the same guy who goes to your church maybe he's the same guy you grew up with when you were a kid right and you're driving down the road, and you're in a residential area, and oh, well, that day you're going 20 miles or uh, 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers over the speed limit. You get stopped, and he comes to the window, right, your car window, and he says, yeah, you know, you've been going 30 kilometers over. I'm going to have to give you a ticket. Now, what do you think he would say if he would say, yeah, but you know what? Come on, Joe. We grew up together. You go to my church. I know who you are. We're no different. What do you think is going to be his response? Well, actually, we are different because... Uh, not that I want to give you a ticket, but I wear the badge and you broke the law. Right? It's kind of the way it is with pastors, elders, and deacons. We're no different in some sense, and yet we are because we bear the badge. And, and here's the thing. In a sense, that's what God is saying to Moses. God is saying to Moses, listen, you do wear the badge, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to confirm, I'm going to confirm your you're standing before the people so that they know you're wearing the badge. So very quickly, God performs three signs to Moses, and he actually performs these signs through Moses in a way in order to demonstrate where God is saying, I am with you, and you wear the badge. Kids, there's one point, I'll just deal with one of the signs, where Moses has a staff, a long stick, and God says, throw it on the ground. So he throws it on the ground. And what happened to it? Turns into a serpent, turns into a snake. And God says to Moses, pick the snake up by the tail. And he does, and it suddenly turns into the staff again. And there are two other signs. And the reason why God performs those signs is to underscore to Moses, but eventually to the people, you're the guy who wears the badge. You're not better than they are, but you wear the badge. Now, pastors and elders and deacons... Their calling is not confirmed in the same way today. I can't perform great miracles before you, neither the elders or the deacons. But the badge is confirmed by God, but also actually by you. The badge is confirmed in this way, and our calling is confirmed in this way, that we've been selected, we've been nominated, we have been elected by you, and we've been put in this position. And all those things confirm the position or the callings to which we've been called and then God goes on to confirm, hopefully, in a good and a healthy way, by the way that we carry out our office, that yes, this pastor or this elder or this deacon um, have been placed into this very, these very important positions. And as a result of that, we are to receive them with submission and respect. And I don't know if you know the Bible, but you know there are times in the history of God's people where they didn't want to do that. And God took that very seriously. He 
He took it very seriously. But anyway, back to Moses, before God confirmed this, Moses felt this fear of rejection. He also felt two other things, palpable fears. Not only the fear of rejection, but the fear of failure and the fear of responsibility. Now, I took a bit of time with this first one. I'm going to be very quick with these two. First of all is the fear of failure. If you've got your Bibles open, take a look at verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, this is after the Lord confirmed through these signs that Moses wore the badge. Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. In other words, I'm not good with words. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. In other words, yeah, you got these hundreds of thousands of people, and I need, I need or, uh, skills of oratory. I need to know how to speak to these people. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm bad with my words. I, I don't have a stage presence, really. And the Lord's response is this. He goes, huh. Did I not create the mouth of man? We could say today, didn't that the Lord, the Lord say, did I not create the mouth of man? Yeah, yeah, I did create the mouth of man. You know what? Here's the thing. I created your mouth too. And I, here's where the Lord says, I'm with you. I'm going to give you the words to speak. Don't worry about it. Fear of rejection, fear of failure. So the Lord says, I'm going to put words in your mouth. It's going to be okay. And then what do we find from Moses? He go, yes, I, I believe that, Lord. I'm, I'm still apprehensive, but I know you'll be with me. No. We have this faithless statement in verse 12. The Lord says, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, here's Moses. Oh, my Lord, please send somebody else. Let somebody else do this. Then, then God gets angry. He gets mad. And why does he get mad? Because he notes in Moses a lack of faith, lack of trust. Lord keeps coming to Moses. You know, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. Moses continues to say, eh, you know, he tries to skirt around it. Excuses, excuses. God gets angry. And it's like God saying, listen, Moses, do you... Do you have fear of rejection? Yeah, you do. But I'm going to perform signs to you to confirm your calling. Moses, do you have a fear of failure? Yeah, you do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the words to speak. Moses, do you have a fear of responsibility? Yes, you do. But I'm going to bring your brother Aaron alongside of you, and he's going to help you in this work. In other words, the Lord is saying, you know what? I know you're apprehensive. I know your feelings of inadequacy, but you need to trust me in this. You need to trust me, and that's a faith commitment on your part, but trust me. Now, I want to get a little bit personal here. Together, we know that we need to trust God, I trust. Even, even if you're a person who is struggling with faith matters and wondering where you're at with God, God says, you know what? Come follow me. Jesus says, come follow me. And trust me that I'll lead you where you need to go. And when it comes to leadership, it's the exact same thing. God says, trust me in this. And yet, and yet there's, there always seems to be this problem. And when, where does that problem rest? It, it, it rests basically, oh, with you and me. We're the problem. We're the problem. And, you know, um, if after the Lord says, trust me in this, we feel still a certain measure of apprehension, I'm not saying that's okay. But if we do feel that way, we're kind of in good company with the number of people in the Bible. God says to Moses, trust me. And, the, and Moses says, I will send somebody else. Let, let somebody else carry out that responsibility. God says to Jeremiah, trust me. And Jeremiah goes, I'm, I'm only a youth. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, God says to Elijah, you remember there's a point where, where Elijah's carrying out his ministry and Jezebel is really angry that Elijah killed the 450 prophets of Baal with a sword. She says, okay, I'm after you now. And she chases after Elijah. Elijah goes into a desert and he sits under a broom tree right? And the Lord basically says to Elijah, you need to trust that I will take care of you. And you remember Elijah's words? Elijah says, oh, Lord, I'm no better than my father's. Kill me now. Just kill me now. 
King Saul is elected by the people to be king. At his coronation time, they go looking for Saul to crown him as king. Where is he? They can't find him. Why? Because he's hiding. God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh among the enemy of the Assyrians, and I want you to preach the gospel to them. And what does Jonah do, right? Jonah goes and go, hey, you know what? Um, that's a daunting task, but I trust you. No, he doesn't go in the direction of Nineveh. He goes in the opposite direction to Tarshish, Spain, to get as far away from the Lord as possible. He's on the run. He's fleeing God's call. Two other examples from church history. How about someone, two names that a number of us, maybe not all of us, but a number of us should know well, John Calvin. The Reformation was raging. People were dying. And there was a man, a red-headed preacher named Guillaume Farrell, who said to Calvin, you need to carry on the Reformation in Geneva. Calvin was a scholar. He didn't want to do that. And then Farrell gets in his face and he says, well, then God curse your studies if you don't help her church in her time of need. And finally, there's someone else that we know, one of the authors of one of the catechisms that we have, uh, um, uh, um, Ursinus, Zachary Ursinus. And the Reformation was raging, and he too needed to carry on the work of the Reformation. He too was a scholar. And so they said, you need to be involved with, with the Reformation. And the other person of the catechism, Olivianus, one of the other authors, was taking it on the chin big time. For the, for the sake of Protestant convictions. And, 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 and Ursinus is like, he's pressed. You've got to continue the work of the Reformation. And Ursinus, like Calvin, just wanted to be a scholar. And he said, oh. Oh, he said, if I could just hide myself in a corner somewhere, if I could just find some shelter in a, in a small village. I did not make those words up. Those are what he said. Yeah, all these men that we respect throughout history, Right? God calls them, one flees, another one wants to escape the responsibility, another one says, kill me now, another one says, just put me in a corner, I don't want to be among these people, on and on and on. You know what you find in this book? You know what you find in this book? Excuse after excuse after excuse. And then finally this, and then I want to draw it to a close. Sometimes it's just not a matter of excuses, but sometimes a man is not making excuses, but he just feels... He just feels weak. He just feels weak as a human being. You look at this. This is uh, actually an old bulletin that goes back 25 years ago. I happened to find this this past week. And I'm looking at it, and it shows, in the back of this bulletin, it shows me elder districts and deacons. And as I looked at this, I thought, human weakness. One man who is the chair of the elders at the time is going through significant health issues now. The second man is gone. He's dead. Third man is dead. Fourth man is dead. Fifth man, sadly, committed suicide. Among the deacons, the first man died while he was in office. He had testicular cancer, moved to his lungs, had to do his funeral. Now, the next man is actually, he was a deacon at the time. He is now, I know in this church, he's now the chair of the elders. The other man died in the last few weeks, and the other man became dissatisfied with where he was living, a little bit with the church, and he moved on. That's human weakness. Shows that we are weak and that we are temporary. And then you know the story sometimes of pastors as well. Pastors who, who have succumbed to pressures and pastors who have who've said, I, I can't do this anymore, and some pastors who have fallen into moral indiscretion and... And that was the end of their ministry. So, you know what? That's reality. In this church, we deal with reality. All right. So, I want to leave you with this. No one ever said leadership was easy. No one ever said leadership was easy. Now, sometimes I find in conservative circles, you know, guys coming in, they always, always have this kind of weight. And then the guys currently serving, when they talk about office, they always talk about the weight and the responsibility. Yeah, there's a lot of that. But there's a lot of joy, too. You know, there really is. So, so when you're in leadership, the highs are really, really high, and for the lows, they're really, really low because you're, you're leading. You're just not a guy in a pew anymore. You're, you're leading. But we have to remember these things. Number one, uh, uh, Fritz and Tim and Mike and all the brothers who are serving the office of elder and deacon, and also for those of you in important unordained positions at Pathway, 
Brother and sister, I want to I encourage you. The Lord knows exactly what you need. We're all inadequate together, right? But the Lord knows exactly what we need. And, and you know what? Um, we, in an effeminate, I'll just say this, in an effeminate age, we need to act like men. And you say, well, I'm a woman. Okay, but you know what I mean. We, we, we need to fulfill responsibilities and with as much joy and reliance upon the Lord as possible. Act, act responsible for the men who are men. Act like men. Guys, we're not little boys anymore. We're men, okay? That's number one. And, and above all, above all, give me one minute. Look to Jesus. I know it sounds simple. We've got to look to Christ because Christ is the chief shepherd. And when Christ fulfilled his office, he never gave up. There's a point in Gethsemane before he went to the cross. And the night before he went to the cross, he did experience weakness. Not sin, but weakness. And he said, Lord, if it is at all possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But then he said, not as I will, Lord, but as you will. So we need to trust Christ. He went to the end. We need to go to the end. Secondly, we need to trust Christ as the source of our forgiveness. Because brothers and, and sisters, we're, we're going to fail in our leadership positions. But, but there's always forgiveness at the foot of the cross, followed by this, by empowerment. Let's always remember that even Jesus himself needed the ministry of the Holy Spirit to help him carry out the calling that he, that, that, that he had. And we too, even more so, are absolutely reliant upon the Spirit. And God says, you know what? I know you need that. And I promise I will give that to you. Keep praying for it. Keep asking for it. So I will leave you that encouragement. Okay, leadership is a wonderful thing. It's a big task. And as goes the church, or as goes the leader, so goes the church. So brothers, may we serve with integrity, and indeed, may we serve with joy. Okay, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of this passage, Lord, we realize, as those in leadership, um, that we, O oh Lord, are not alone. As Jesus says, lo, I am with you to the end of the age. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for that encouragement and we pray that as leaders, you would give us fidelity to our calling, that you would give us boldness, that you would give us wisdom and discernment, shepherding hearts, O oh God, and also joy, joy and anticipation, too, of the great things that you promise to do through us as we carry out our offices faithfully before you. And Lord, this we bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing together, um, I think appropriate.